Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. We start today's video with a couple of small improvements in the renderer. However, most of this video is about fixing an issue in our vector class implementation, which requires me to make an attempt to explain some concepts in C++ template metaprogramming. First, I would like to remove this default render target format from Core CPP. Since we will have different kinds of render targets which have their own default formats, I think the way it is now will become confusing later. Right now, we only need to have a default format for swap chain back buffers. So let's start by removing this function from Core CPP. By the way, let's also remove the example code for creating root signature and pipeline state objects from the previous episode since we don't need it anymore. I'll add a constant in the 3D12 surface class for the default back buffer format and use it instead of calling the function from course CPP. I'll also make the format parameter in create swap chain function optional. It will use this new constant by default, but we can always provide a different one. Now we need to remember the format that was used to create the swap chain, and therefore I add a member variable to hold that information. We set the format variable during swap chain creation. Next, I'd like to use a generic name for ID3D12 device and ID3D12 graphics command lists interfaces. This is because it's cumbersome to keep track of interface versions used in different parts of the code. For example, here we use an ID3D12 graphics command list 6 interface. And it could be time consuming to search all call sites every time we want to use a newer interface. That's why I'm going to use a type alias for these two interfaces, since they are most often passed around. Later I might add more interface name aliases, but for now this will do. Now we can use these type names everywhere else and in the future if we want to use a different or newer interface version, there is only one place where we have to change it. So let's search and replace all ID3D12 device 8 occurrences. And do the same for ID3D12 graphics command lists. The next fix that I'd like to do is an issue in our vector implementation that was brought to my attention by Wing, who is brave enough to do a port slash expansion slash re-implementation of the engine for different platforms, which is awesome and I can't wait to see how it's coming along. It turned out that some constructs that I used in the vector class are not part of the standard template library. 
Although they are in the standard namespace, it seems that they only appear in Microsoft's implementation. And if we want to make the vector class platform independent, we need to do something about that. Fortunately, there are only three constructs that we need to replace. Is iterator v? Is copy constructable v? And is default constructable v? The latter two are rather easy to fix. We just use the value explicitly because that's part of standard C++. Is iterator v, however, doesn't have a standard C++ equivalent and we need to implement it ourselves. Wing was so awesome to share his implementation with us in Discord, which by the way, you are all welcome to join if you haven't already. However, instead of copy-pasting that code, I'm going to first make sure that I understand it by trying to explain how it works. I'm going to be lazy and just use test renderer CPP for a minute for my explanation. Also, precisely explaining this subject requires me to be pretty much as hardcore a C++ programmer as someone in the C++ standard committee, which I'm certainly not, so you'll have to excuse my hand wavy explanation here. Let's start with enable if. First, I'll write a function that has the same signature as the constructor in vector class. Then I add the template struct for enable if, which takes a boolean non type parameter and a type parameter t. Then we can specialize this template for the case where the boolean parameter is true. In this case, we also define a member type which is simply the same as the type parameter t. When evaluating template specializations, the compiler tries to pick the one that best matches the template arguments. So in case of enable if, when the boolean test parameter is true, the compiler will pick the template specialization which explicitly uses the true value. So right now our template function is one that accepts a template type t and an optional integer parameter with a default value of 0. As you can see, it works fine with any type of parameter t. But what will happen if the boolean template argument is false? After all, there is no member type defined when test is false. Enter Svinai. Svinai. This is a rule that states that substitution failure is not an error. Or Svinai. In short. Again, since I'm only human, I'll have to refer you to the documentation for a precise definition. But what it comes down to is that when the compiler can't substitute a template argument, like here in our template function, when the test boolean is false and enable if doesn't have a member type, it doesn't treat it as a failure. Hence, Svinai. In that case, the compiler simply ignores the function and happily continues compiling the rest of the code. And if it happens to bump into another implementation of this function that it does manage to compile for the same parameters as in the call site, then all will be fine. As you can see here, the function call with the integer parameter is accepted. Svinai. Now we can use something that evaluates to a boolean as the template parameter for enable if. For example, we could write something that returns true if the template type t is an iterator and false otherwise. In the same way as we implemented the enable if, now I can write a template boolean variable that has a type t and an optional nameless parameter with a default type of void. Then I can write a specialization of it. In this case, we want something that defines a valid member type when t is an iterator. Fortunately, we have the iterator traits, which define a member type iterator category only if t is an iterator. Notice that this doesn't work since the template specialization can't be evaluated for any type other than void. So somehow we need to convert iterator category to void. For this, we can write another template type that simply converts any type t to void. Using this template type, we see that the function now accepts a pointer, which is a type of iterator.
So now hopefully my explanation sheds some light on how this works and we all have an idea of what is needed for writing this kind of functions. And therefore I can safely go ahead and remove this constructor because there is no way on earth in a million years that I'm going to put up with this much complexity just to copy the elements of an array. I didn't even go into how iterator traits works and frankly that's how much template metaprogramming I can take before I go. <laughs> If I ever want to copy a vector, I'll write the function body of the constructor I just deleted. Anyway, let's remove this template stuff, compile our code and deal with the consequences. Okay, so the only place that that vector constructor was used is where we load the binary game data when we launch the game using the editor. Let me first refactor parts of this function and then use another method for reading that file. First, I'm going to write a function that changes the current working directory to the one containing the executable. There is no platform independent way of getting the executable's path that I know of. Therefore, I use get module file name, which is a Windows API function that gets us the full path of the executable, including its file name. Then we use standard file system to get the parent folder and set it as the current working directory. We also return this path in case the call site also needs it. Next, instead of calling this function randomly, we call it once when the application starts and everyone can just assume that the current working directory is set to the executable's path. Therefore, I'm going to move that function to main CPP and call it in the main function before we initialize the engine. Remember, we have a main function in the engine and another one in our test application. Since we don't have an I.O. library yet, I'm going to duplicate this function for now. Here we are getting a warning about the fact that we disabled exception handling. This is because file system header includes other headers that use exception handling. We did suppress this warning in the common headers, so let's include it here to disable this warning. That takes care of setting the working directory. Now let's write a function that we can call to read an entire file into memory. Let's be creative and think of an original name for our function. It takes a path, a reference to a unique pointer and a reference to an integer. It's a rather straightforward function. It checks whether the file exists, gets the size of it, allocates a chunk of memory using that size, opens and reads the file into memory, and finally closes that file. Note the operator overload here that calls another function that indicates failure. 
in the load game function, instead of using the vector constructor, now I call this function to read the file. In comparison, I find this code to be a lot more clear in what it does than before, which is a plus as well. Let me try and test if loading a game still works when we launch it in the level editor. I'm getting a new error here because we changed the build configuration, which includes building the content tools. And apparently the vector is trying to construct something using the move constructor. However, because I copy pasted this from the copy constructor, I accidentally left a const keyboard in there, which prevents moving the parameter into the vector. I can remove it to fix the error and we can continue. As you can see, the game is launched without any problems, which means that we can go back to programming our graphics renderer. Originally, I wanted to start this new episode working on shader compilation. However, the fixes that I did here took longer than I expected. So in the next part of this episode, I'm going to discuss shader compilation using DirectX Shader Compiler. As always, thank you so much for joining me today and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time. Until then, take care and happy game engineering.